I would like to thank the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh. I'm very excited about this sponsorship because my family and I have been using HelloFresh for a few years now. It's always my go-to meal service. Plus, if you're like me and you promised yourself you would stick to your New Year's goals this year, then HelloFresh is here to help. They will help you eat better by delivering fresh ingredients and easy recipes right to your door, basically taking the hassle out of dinner time. With HelloFresh, I can cut back on my trips to the grocery store, allowing me to spend more time researching true crime cases. Okay, I know what you're thinking. You can totally use a delivery service or pick up takeout, but let's be honest, those options have gotten very expensive. With HelloFresh, you will not only save money, but you'll be able to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right in your own kitchen, way faster than waiting on delivery. Like I said earlier, I've been using HelloFresh for a few years now, and it's something that my husband and I love to do together. I'm not personally a fan of the grocery store, and when I'm super busy working on video content, I can use HelloFresh and cut my meal planning and prep from 1 to 2 hours down to 20 minutes. All right, let's get started with unboxing HelloFresh. The box comes with everything you need to prepare your delicious meal. And don't forget to grab the recipes out of the side. I let my husband choose what we're cooking, and he selected the Tostados Supremo with pork. Even Benny is excited about our choice. The next step is to unpack the bag with all the ingredients. Then I start cutting up the vegetables. Once that's done, I get my husband to start browning the pork in a pan with a little olive oil. And don't forget the seasoning, which we almost did. Once the pork is almost done, we add the onions and poblano peppers and continue cooking it. While that's cooking, I prep the tortillas with some olive oil and place them in the oven. Once the pork is done, we add the Tex-Mex paste and a quarter cup of water and let that cook for a couple more minutes. In the meanwhile, I need to prep the pico and crema. Once everything is done, it's time to put it all together. Now for the best part, tasting. Oh my god, these tostadas were so good, we even invited his parents over to help us eat them, and they enjoyed them as well. Y'all must be hungry after watching that, so stop watching right now and go to HelloFresh.com and use code SOUTHERN65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's 65% off plus free shipping at HelloFresh.com using my code SOUTHERN65. I promise you won't regret it. Christy Lynn Carroll was born on July 25, 1976, and grew up in Tennessee, where she loved to rescue abandoned and injured animals. Christy was described as a friendly, outgoing girl who was very close to her mother and grandparents. At the age of 18, Christy was a mother herself to an 18-month-old daughter named Brittany and was living with Christy's mother, Cricket, in the very small rural town of Hohenwald, Tennessee. On Saturday, February 4, 1995, Christy made plans to stay at her friend Kim Burleson's house, then go to her grandmother's house the next day for lunch. Christy and Kim went to a local bar that night, and at about 11.20 p.m., Christy's younger brother Ted and three of his friends stopped by to hang out for a bit. Christy asked one of the friends if he could drop her off at Kim's house, but he said he couldn't because he had to pick up his mother from work in about 10 minutes at 11.30 p.m. So Kim found another ride home, and Christy went with her brother and his friends as they rode around town because they weren't ready to call it a night. After riding around for a few minutes, they saw two more friends, Daniel Lay and Eric Amaker, who told Christy they would give her a ride to Kim's. Just a few minutes before midnight, Sheriff Deputy Lloyd Sherman and his partner happened upon a car sitting on the side of the road in the freezing weather halfway between Christy and Kim's houses. The deputy would see Christy, Daniel, and Eric, and Daniel told the officer that the car overheated and they didn't need help. Two hours later, at 2 a.m., Deputies responded to a call reporting a suspicious man walking on the side of a road near where the overheated car had been located. Upon investigation, they would find Eric walking alone without Daniel and Christy down a street close to the highway where the three were last seen. He had wrecked a car in a ditch and was leaving the scene, but it was a different car than the one he was driving earlier that night. At this point, it was unclear where Christy and Daniel were. The next day, Christy never showed up for lunch at her grandmother's house. 
Initially angry that she was late, Christy's mother and grandmother called around to see if any of her other friends knew where she was. That's when they would learn that she never made it back to Kim's house that night. On Monday, February 6, 1995, Christy's mother went to the police station to report her daughter missing, ignoring the then-required 72-hour wait. 30 minutes later, Christy's body was discovered by the mail carrier lying next to the driveway near the mailbox of the home she shared with her daughter and mother. She was barefoot with a bloody face and muddy clothes. Her pants legs were rolled up, and her shirt, which had been ripped in the front and back, was up exposing her stomach. Despite all this, investigators first ruled her cause of death accidental due to hypothermia. Her mother said she came and went from her home several times on Sunday and Monday and never saw her daughter's bloody body next to the driveway. At the time, the coroner who performed her autopsy was barred from performing autopsies, due to an ongoing investigation of malfeasance. He did not suggest a time of death or complete a sexual assault kit, so the autopsy performed at the time was lacking at best. Her blood alcohol level was tested, but for some reason they wrote down two different numbers, 0.01 and 0.10. Coagulated blood was found in her stomach, possibly from the result of a beating. Shockingly, nothing was done by authorities to rule out homicide. If you wish to view the crime scene photos, you can find the links in the description. When Daniel and Eric were interviewed, they first told the police that they had dropped Christy off at her house between 12.30 and 1 a.m. Eric said he walked her to the door and she went inside. Eric then changed his story and said that he dropped her off halfway up her driveway and she was walking toward the house when they drove away. In a later interview, they both said they saw her fall in her driveway as they drove away. Both men admitted they propositioned Christy for sex before dropping her off, but she declined. Also, both men refused to take lie detector tests. Later, Eric called the police and told them he wanted to talk. When they got to his house, his mother answered the door with a lawyer on the phone. She then refused to let Eric speak to the police. Eight months later, Eric again tried to confess the details of the night under the condition that he be granted immunity. The district attorney at the time, Joseph Ball, also known as Joe, reportedly refused, and Eric's mother, once again, kept him from speaking under the advice of an attorney. Agent Tenery conducted an almost non-existent investigation into Christie's death. He told Christie's mother that he knew the Amaker family very well and said that Eric was a good boy and refused to do the forensic testing that she requested. For example, Cricket noticed mud on Christie's body that didn't appear to have come from the location where she was left. She asked him to have comparative soil tests done to confirm this theory, but he told her that he wouldn't do that and said that such attention to detail was just TV stuff. The family is so well-known in Hohenwald, they even had a street named after them, called Amaker Avenue. The Lewis County Sheriff's Department talked to the district attorney's office investigator, and he said that he was willing to investigate, but Joe Ball wouldn't allow it. At the time, Christie's death got very little press coverage, and her loved ones insisted the true cause of her death and her alleged murderers were being protected by law enforcement in the county. Her loved ones believed she was killed elsewhere and dumped where she was ultimately found, and political corruption basically shut down the case. Christie's mother made audio tapes of various police interviews, among other blatant discrepancies. The DA's General Conference Executive Secretary, Pat McCutcheon, was asked by a Tennessee Crime Victims Coalition representative why Joe Ball refused to investigate the murder of Christie properly. After consulting with him, Pat reported back to this person that Joe Ball indicated that the matter was unimportant to him and called Christy a very derogatory word. Joe Ball lives in none other than Franklin, Tennessee, and if you've watched my video titled The Shocking Corruption and Abuse in Franklin, Tennessee, you will see why it makes the outcome of this case even more infuriating. It's suspected that Daniel was the leader in this crime since Eric kept trying to confess to the police but was banned from doing so. 
In addition, Christie's 17-year-old brother Ted was involved in legal troubles regarding a brawl with a man. The sitting judge was Cornelia Clark, and many felt that it was unethical for Judge Clark not to have recused herself from this case in light of her personal relationship with Joe Ball, but she never did. The testimony against Ted came largely from a young man and his girlfriend who had a record of using and dealing cocaine. The man is accepted by most as an informant for the DA's office and maintains his relative freedom by helping them get convictions. He said that Ted had beaten him and threatened his life. The defense testimony included a statement by a veteran school teacher who was highly respected and trusted in the community. Her version of the events described a situation that made it virtually impossible for Ted to have been guilty. Instead, she was mocked and they insinuated that she was a liar and incompetent. Judge Clark sentenced Ted Carroll to three years in jail. He only served four months, but many felt that it was a warning to the Carroll family to hush about Christie's case or suffer the consequences. To this day, Eric remains in Hohenwald, Tennessee, still holding on to the story he wanted to tell all those years ago. James Daniel Lay passed away on December 29, 2005, allegedly while fleeing from the police. Christie's daughter has grown up to be a spitting image of her beautiful mother. No one has ever been charged in Christie's death, and as of February 2023, the case remains closed. Jenna Van Gelderen was born and named after her great-aunt Janetta, who died during the Holocaust after being transported to Auschwitz on the same transport as Anne Frank. In August of 2017, 25-year-old Jenna was house-sitting for her parents, Leon and Roseanne, in the Druid Hills neighborhood of Atlanta, Georgia, near Emory College, while they were vacationing in Canada. Jenna had been there for about three days, mostly to take care of the elderly cat, which required multiple injections on a daily basis, and Jenna didn't feel comfortable giving them. So, her brother Will Van Getteren and a vet tech would take turns coming over to give the shots. On the morning of Saturday, August 19th, Will called the house around 9.30, but Jenna never answered. About an hour later, he arrived at the house and found that Jenna's 2010 blue Mazda 6 was gone. In addition, all the doors to the house were locked, the lights and the TV were on, and it didn't appear Jesse had been fed. He found a mess left behind in some of the rooms and figured Jenna most likely had had some friends over. However, Will found it strange that Jesse hadn't been fed because Jenna was always responsible for Jesse and loved him very much. The tech came by later that day to administer another injection to Jesse, but the doors were locked and Jenna once again wasn't there. She tried to call Jenna, but she didn't answer, which was strange because Jenna had told her family she would be there all weekend. Jenna had been diagnosed a year earlier with high-functioning autism, and although she was very independent, she was extremely trusting, naive, and vulnerable. This sometimes led to people taking advantage of her and manipulating her into doing things that she wouldn't normally do. Will stayed the night and left the next morning. He returned to his parents' house later that day and once again noticed more things he'd missed the day before. The family's large and heavy framed five foot by two foot Egyptian tapestry was strangely missing from the wall. It had been purchased by Will's grandfather in the 1940s around World War II when he was in Egypt. According to the family, it would have taken at least two people to remove the frame from its spot. The tapestry was of sentimental value and had little monetary worth, leading the family to question why a thief would have targeted it. It didn't make sense to Will because there were TVs and other valuable items still in the home. He called his parents and together they agreed to file a missing persons report. Her parents called the police from Canada and begged them to do some forensic testing of the house and maybe try to get some fingerprints, but the decal police refused. So Roseanne and Leon cut their trip short and made their way home. Not long after arriving, Jenna's father, Leon, noticed that the suitcase Jenna had brought with her to the house was also missing. 
They knew that Jenna had at least two people, if not more, over that night. Jenna had worked at Pet Supply Plus because she loved animals, but all that ended in April 2017, four months before her disappearance. While working, Jenna had been coerced by certain men to steal close to $3,000 from the company, which led to her termination and a misdemeanor charge. When the family later accessed Jenna's records, they discovered she had been making payments to someone through Western Union since 2015 and that the transfers stopped in the months leading up to her disappearance. When her parents found out about her stealing, they became extremely concerned about the group of friends that Jenna had started hanging out with that year. After being fired, Jenna had a T-Mobile iPhone on her parents' family plan, allowing her father to access her phone activities. He would notice that she was still talking to people that weren't a good influence on her, and he confronted her about it. As a result, Jenna became very upset and moved out of her parents' house, rented a room in an apartment from a man, and refused to tell her parents where she was living. The area where the apartment was located was surrounded by many less-than-savory characters and was not far from her parents' house. After Jenna vanished, her parents found out she actually had two cell phones, one on their T-Mobile family plan and another on a private account. The private phone was through Metro PCS, but they were unable to access it. They were, however, able to get the contacts from the T-Mobile phone on Leon's account, and they called all of her contacts, even her new friends, asking if anybody knew where Jenna could be. They were eventually able to find out the location of the room she rented. It was on Lenox Street in Lenox Woods Apartments, about three miles from her parents' home. They contacted Jenna's roommate, asking if they could come look at her bedroom. He told them on September 1st he would throw all of her stuff out if she didn't return and pay the rent. He refused to let the police search the apartment, but he has not been named a suspect in the case. Her friends told them about a man that Jenna said was her boyfriend. The Van Gelderens called this man up, and he told them he didn't see Jenna on the Friday night she disappeared, and he spent the night alone. Her parents gave this information, along with the items left by her friends at their house, to the DeKalb County Police Department, who agreed to speak to Jenna's roommate and the so-called boyfriend. Her boyfriend told them that on the night that Jenna disappeared, she showed up at his house, and he broke up with her. He also told them that she was selling her body for money and was addicted to drugs. Eventually, he quit cooperating and lawyered up. The police eventually went to Jenna's apartment and spoke with her male roommate. He told them the same thing, that he was getting ready to throw her stuff out. Instead, he gave her property to the police to give to the family, which only consisted of a few bags of clothes. There was strangely no bedding, such as a mattress, blankets, or pillows. The roommate told the police that Jenna didn't have a bed and slept on the floor. However, one friend claimed to her family that a mattress was in the bedroom. The family was basically left to find Jenna on their own, so they made a website called Help Find Jenna Van Gelderen, and two weeks later posted a picture of Jenna's missing dark blue Mazda 6. On September 5th, a woman saw the Facebook post and said she had seen Jenna's car on the side of the road while driving to the gym. It was parked on the side of DeFore Place Northwest in Northwest Atlanta, about seven miles from her parents' house. When they found her car, it was dirty and covered with leaves and debris, and the keys were missing. The doors were unlocked, it was low on gas, and the driver's seat had been pushed back as far and as low as it could go. Jenna was only four foot eleven and could not have possibly driven the car that way. Her missing suitcase was inside the car, along with her purse and glasses. They also found an unidentified person's shoes and phone charger. To this day, both of her phones are still missing. There was no immediate sign of foul play, and the police towed the car and looked through it before releasing it to her parents. Will was able to access her phone records, email, and social media accounts, and through a series of Google chats, the family learned she had spoken to an unknown individual the night she vanished. The individual was pressuring Jenna to leave her family's home and return to her apartment. The Van Gelderens, however, have not been able to determine who the messages were from. 
The family was able to make a timeline of Jenna's activities on the night she disappeared based on phone records and Google Maps from the T-Mobile phone along with her debit card transactions. They determined that on Friday night, she was hanging out with her friend Bailey at her parents' house. Around 8.30 p.m., a male friend of Jenna's made plans with her to get something to eat. She then returned to her apartment again, but only for a few minutes, and at some point had picked up food from the fast food restaurant Wendy's. Afterward, Google Maps showed nothing on her second phone, so it either died or was turned off. However, on her other phone at 11.50 p.m. that evening, she had two missed calls from a friend that was supposed to meet her for food. At 2.15 a.m., she texted her friend Stacy in South Carolina, who had spoken to her earlier, and the message read that she was going to lie down. Several months after she went missing through phone records, the police and family learned that Jenna's T-Mobile phone was last pinged at 7.15 on Saturday morning in Fulton County in Fairburn, Georgia, about 20 miles away from her home. Around the same time, her car was spotted by a license plate reader back in Atlanta. It showed that the car and the phone were likely not in the same place at that time. You could see that her car was being driven far away from where her phone was at 7.15 in the morning. It's unknown if Jenna was with her phone, in her car, or possibly with neither. Finally, forensic analysis of Jenna's parents' house, her mother's car, and her car were inconclusive. Search teams made up of Jenna's friends, family, and investigators have searched the area where her phone was last pinged, but found no clues to her whereabouts. Someone knows something, and despite a $50,000 reward for information, this case, as of February 2023, remains unsolved. Robert Alexander Easterling, or Alex as he was known, was born on March 22, 1992. At the age of 30, Alex was the father of a young daughter and was living in Holmes County, Mississippi. On Wednesday, April 20, 2022, Alex was dropped off at a friend's home on Stockyard Road in Pickens at about 8.15 p.m. When he was dropped off, he said he wouldn't be long and would call when he was ready for a ride. Earlier in the day, his mother, Ashley Martin, had picked him up from jail, where he had served time after being arrested on February 16th for an outstanding warrant in Hines County, stemming from a 2020 grand larceny charge. His charge was reduced to a misdemeanor, and he was released on a pretrial intervention. On top of that, Alex had struggled with substance abuse issues for the past few years. As Ashley was dropping him off at his friend, D. Edward Anderson, a.k.a. Chucky's trailer on Stockyard Road, she noticed numerous old vehicles and floodlights. This made her comment to Alex that it looked like a chop shop. The next morning, she became concerned when she still had not heard from Alex. She then reported him missing on Friday, April 22nd. Sheriff Willie March went to the trailer on Stockyard Road and spoke with Chucky about Alex. He confirmed that Alex had stopped by on Wednesday night, and while they were there on the front porch talking, Alex asked for some phone numbers since he had just gotten a new phone that day. Chucky says he went inside to get his phone, and when he came back out, Alex was just gone. Alex's grandfather also went to this location to speak with Chucky later that day. Chucky told him that they were just talking on the front porch, he went inside to put on a t-shirt, and when he came back, Alex was gone. Later that same day, a deputy spoke with Chucky, who changed his story again and said that he went inside to get a cigarette, and when he came out, Alex was gone. Three different responses to the same question. Aside from this informal questioning, Chucky has still, to this day, not been formally interviewed by any law enforcement. Later that day, with help from Equisearch, drones were dispatched over the area. The next day, a large search ensued with about 100 volunteers and several canine teams from multiple states. Chucky granted them access to his property, but as soon as the canine began tracking Alex's scent around the trailer, Chucky began waving his arms and yelled to the handlers that Alex didn't go back there. 
When they asked how he knew that, since he claimed he went inside to grab something, and when he came out, Alex was gone, Chucky withdrew and revoked their access to search the property. Meanwhile, Ashley researched his phone records and learned how to read metadata. She discovered that it looked like Alex was at the trailer at one point, and then it appeared he ran off the back porch, fell, or was knocked down. The next phone ping showed up a few hours later at 12.23 a.m. across the street. To Ashley, it looked like someone had tossed Alex's phone. A $15,000 reward was created by the family when Sheriff Willie March stated that the Holmes County Crime Stoppers would not publish a reward. Therefore, it has become his mother's mission to find out what happened to her son and locate him. Unfortunately, the sheriff's department stopped their investigation into Alex's disappearance. Ashley said they have pleaded for help from Sheriff March, who coincidentally has close ties with Chucky. He has told Alex's loved ones that they have done all they can do. However, that doesn't make sense to Ashley because Chucky has never been formally interviewed. He is a convicted drug dealer on parole who they feel has been given a free pass. Alex has many people that love him, including his mother and young daughter, who grieve their loss daily. Sadly, as of February 2023, Alex has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Nancy Ambrosic was born on April 25, 1948. At the age of 46, Nancy and her husband, Joseph Ambrosic, were living in Cobb County, Georgia, with their four children. Nancy was a beloved nurse working in a local emergency room. On March 14, 1995, Nancy returned home from her night shift at the hospital, and before going to bed, she saw her children off to school. About eight hours later, her husband returned home from work and called 911 to say he had found his wife's deceased body in their bedroom. When the police arrived at the Ambrosic home on Clare Circle in Marietta, Georgia, they found Nancy lying face up on the carpet between the bed and the dresser. Her hands were raised above her head, and she had numerous cuts on her head and face. The medical examiner concluded she suffered a sudden, violent attack that began as she lay sleeping in her bed and ruled her death a homicide caused by strangulation and blunt force trauma. Investigators would not find any signs of a break-in, ruling out the possibility of a robbery gone wrong. Marianne Facklum, one of Nancy's sisters, would later testify that two days before the murder, Nancy came to her telling her that Joe had been acting strange and was up to something. She then asked Marianne if she could give her power of attorney so the right decision for her kids would be made in the event that something happened to her. During the investigation, Joseph told the detective that he and Nancy had a loving relationship and were happily married. However, when the detective began talking to Nancy's co-workers and siblings, they told a different story. They told him the family had been having money problems because Joseph, who had a bachelor's degree in teaching, was working as a courier. Despite bringing in very little income, he would constantly charge thousands of dollars to the family's credit cards. The couple had divorced once before in 1989, about the same time her husband had filed for bankruptcy, but would later remarry. Before her murder, she had spoken of plans to throw him out for good. After his wife died in 1995, Joseph took his two minor children and moved to Kissimmee, Florida, near Orlando. Police reportedly had no physical evidence that Joseph killed his wife, and the murder weapon was never found. However, in 1997, a civil jury decided he was probably responsible for her death and found that he shouldn't receive her life insurance, and it was split between her four children instead. Joseph was hired in 2002 to work at a high school in Hollywood, Florida, and now teaches algebra and coaches girls' soccer and co-ed golf. School officials have reported that they didn't know about the police investigation until after they hired him because he had no criminal record. However, the suspicions swirling around Joseph have split the family, 
with their two older adult children defending their father's innocence and the other two believing he murdered their mother. Joseph has repeatedly denied involvement in his wife's death, saying that the accusations are ridiculous. He was the last to see her that morning before heading off to work, and he was the one who found her that same afternoon on their bedroom floor. Therefore, he is either a victim in all this by having to deal with his wife's murder and 27 years later still being haunted by accusations that he did it, or he is, according to one daughter, a cold manipulator who not only outsmarted police, but reinvented a new life for himself. According to the lead detective on the case, he has been the main suspect in his wife's death from the beginning. A spokeswoman with the Cobb County District Attorney's Office said the case is still under investigation and stated that DAs have been less and less inclined to prosecute a case based on circumstantial evidence because physical evidence is what juries want to see. As of February 2023, no one has ever been arrested for the murder of Nancy Ambrosic, and this case remains unsolved. This next case involves a Jane Doe that was discovered on June 7, 1979, and hasn't received very much coverage. The Jane Doe's body was found in a grape vineyard near the intersection of 8th Street and Rochester Street in Rancho Cucamonga, California, leading to her becoming known as Rancho Cucamonga Jane Doe. It is believed she was killed the day before, on June 6, 1979. She is estimated to have been between 15 and 30 years old with light brown shoulder-length hair. She was 5 foot 2 and approximately 100 to 110 pounds. She was wearing only green socks and brown leather ankle-height lace-up shoes. She had distinctive appearing teeth with a slight overbite, and her two upper front teeth overlapped slightly. She had tragically been strangled and suffered from blunt force trauma. In January 2009, her body was exhumed to obtain a DNA sample. Eventually, this led to at least 50 missing women being ruled out as being the Rancho Cucamonga Jane Doe. In 2010, the NYPD released 215 photos taken by convicted serial killer Rodney Alcala in an attempt to secure identifications and restart cold case inquiries. The photos were kept quiet until Alcala was sentenced to death. Soon after, Huntington County Police posted 137 of the less graphic pictures online, and 21 of them were quickly identified, often by the women themselves. It's theorized that the Jane Doe could possibly be one of the women in these photos. It's unclear if genetic genealogy has been performed using her DNA profile, but as of February 2023, the Jane Doe remains unidentified and this case remains unsolved. Thank you.